Well, all right, all right, all right, and welcome back to another exciting episode of the Planet Gen X podcast. I'm Sean, that over there is Brian, and joining us again via the audio airwaves is our good buddy, Joel. Hey, hey. Hey, buddy. Good What's to up, have everybody? you back. Yeah. Thank so, you, good to be we're, well, we're very glad to have you, sir. So before yeah. we get into anything right off the bat, guys, I just want to ask you to please hit that subscribe button, click the like button, leave us a comment. Got us getting a lot more comments lately, getting some likes. It's very cool. Very cool. We thank you so much. So um, here we are again, Discovery, Season 5, Episode 8. Brian, what pray tell is that title? Uh, I believe it's called Labyrinth. <clears throat> I was trying Labyrinth. to mess that up. Labyrinth. I couldn't mess it up enough to be funny. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. So, yeah, Labyrinth is uh, the name of the episode, obviously, to uh, refer back to the Labyrinth of the Mind manuscript that we right. became familiar with in previous episodes. So... We begin with a zoom out and pan of the Breen smacking their poles into the deck of the ship. I didn't realize how funny that was until I just read it back. <laughs> <clears throat> it's a uh, it's a funeral for Locke. Is this a foreshadowing, guys? Huh? Maul says, I'll so. fix this. I promise. Nope. You don't think that's foreshadowing? Nope. Okay. Because, I mean, we already said that we thought he was going to get brought back. I, I, I think... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think at this point, he is coming back. We are going to see him again. That's the only way we can get over with this story. So I think the foreshadowing is done. I think what you're seeing now is just an annoyance. I'm this, wondering this if what you mean about the foreshadowing is more of like an ascension ceremony that's being foreshadowed. Is that what you're talking about? Oh, no, yeah. I'm just saying she says, I'll fix this. I promise. She's saying, I'm going to bring him back. He's your scion. Yeah. I'm going to bring him back. Right. That, Yes. Yeah, right. I think he, yeah, I think he's coming back. I don't know. I have no doubt about that, but I wouldn't, you know, I think well, I, I mean like that. so we, we said that last episode. Exactly, but they haven't said it yet. So I'm saying this is the right. first time they're, they're acknowledging slow. it. Right. Yes, they are. This one's this one's got its fair share too. Uh the Primarch the Primarch says that Maul has had enough time standing with Locke and he sends a lieutenant up to motion her away. It's interesting to me, this gentleness with which uh, this Breen touches her arm, uh, it seems like the Primarch notices it too. And uh, is this the first sign that uh, some of the Breen are not actually opposed to Locke and Maul's union? You know, uh, I was kind would, of wondering if it was day. something else, um, kind of like <laughs> these uh, authoritarian regimes and whatnot, uh, warlike nations, et cetera, et cetera, of how the, uh, you know, the people that have, uh, comprise, uh, the citizenry, citizenry, so to speak, uh, may not be, uh, represented by the, uh, the authoritarian in, in control. Um, so maybe there's more compassion in the brain that we've seen presented, I guess. Is what yeah, I'm well, saying. yeah, we don't know because they just haven't been. <clears throat> we just don't know that much about them. This is right. the most we've ever gotten. Uh, while the Primarch speaks, all the Breen start chanting for the Scion, you know, to which the Primarch shouts silence. And it's interesting here because the lieutenant that went up to Maul apologizes to the Primarch and Maul is looking around in wonderment. Is the Primarch uh, feeling the rally around Locke and not himself, guys? Uh, I don't know if it is at that point, but definitely during, the, during this episode, yeah. Joel? I, 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 I'd rather let you, you know, get through what you'd like to get through, because I had so many problems with this whole episode and, and several of these pieces that you're talking about. Are, I mean, this is a spoiled brat. This, this dude, the Primark dude, yeah. the, the writing on it is is it's not good. I yeah, mean, this, this whole this whole situation is 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 not good. He's not uh, honoring Breen at all yeah. through the entire existence. Horribly, of, right. either that or he's a brat, and he like his brother, or I think it said it was his uncle, right? I mean, uh, yeah, that's that's in this, uncle. In this uncle, right? Yeah. So I don't remember having conversation with 
family members being this bad, but I, I know it happens. I mean, I get it, but an, an uncle and a nephew, uh, have they got this much, you know, problem with each other that yeah, he, yeah he, dude's dead, dude's dude's dead on the table there. And this guy, I've seen families with immediate members that were worse than this. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, I'm saying it does, but you know, uh, to to bark at all tradition, to throw everything yeah. out the window, to sacrifice the entire crew, to to you know, I'm thinking to myself. Really, guys, this this is where you're gonna go with the writing. You know, I have a problem with all of it. I, the character himself, I, I, I'm like, yeah, there's no depth to this. He's a spoiled little brat. Yeah, I, guess. I agree. And I don't know. We'll get we'll get more we'll get more from you because I know we'll get there. Uh, yeah. So right after he says silence, Ma immediately shouts, "I can bring him back to you," which is exactly what we thought, as yep. foreshadowed earlier. Yeah. So Ma asked to be set free and to be able to assist in this noble quest to restore the Scion. And the Primarch considers it, looks at his followers, and decides to kill her. No, just kidding. <laughs> I had to uh, interject something in there to keep me going. Because I was like, please, somebody kill her now. Uh, right. He says, of course, we want nothing more to see than our Scion return. And naturally, he's acting like it's all for the Scion and the betterment of his people, but he wants the power, and he knows that if he said anything other than, of course... And his followers would have turned on him, right? I mean, that's that's what I got. I mean, that's what I'm right. feeling already in this. And we're we're barely a few minutes into the episode. Uh, the Primarch has her freed, but not before he whispers in her ear that if she speaks to the soldiers again, he will eviscerate her. And she pops back. I don't think the Scion would like that very much. So she knows she has the Primarch bent over a barrel now. For now, anyway. Uh, so we now move to Discovery, jumping into the Badlands from where we uh, left off last episode. They find a beacon inside the Badlands, and it's made from the same metal as the the, be uh, the little card thing that they had. Uh, Burnham has Tilly transmit a scan of the card to the beacon, <clears throat> and after a minute or so, they get a hollow image of this uh, being called Hyrel. We don't know what race she is, so that's why I refer to her as a being. Um, shit. we do know her race. I can't do remember we? what it is. We haven't seen many of them throughout the years. It's the first female of them we've seen. I think we've only seen a couple of others. Um, it, I want to say it starts with an E. I'll see if I can figure that out while you can. Uh, yeah, that'd be awesome. So one yeah. of the sworn order who tends to the eternal gallery and archive and calls it home. Yes. Ephrosian. A Frosian. Okay. Yeah. Good for that. I would have done that. I would have looked that up too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, I, I had it in the back of my head and I knew it. And I I looked I, I I was interested because I liked that character. She was well when she was introduced, it kind of wore off as the episode went along and she just yeah. kind of like performed her role as a you know, a cog in the machine of the episode. But she's uh, all right. The beginning, I liked her a lot. I, I thought she, she was uh, quirky and funny and interesting and all the things that you expect mm, from the funny a was, guest. Yeah. The funny was over the top a little bit. It was forced. It's like, Nam, now she's got people here. She's just going to start doing her one liners. Right. Um, well, I mean, it's something you expect from a, an archivist, right? Social awkwardness. <laughs> yeah. They get the invite and coordinates to the archive and head in. I felt like I was on uh, the people mover at Disney World, the way the archive was going on about its history and stuff. It was really weird. Right. Um, did we get a lot of screen time with the Washicon and Detmer's replacements? Mm. Oh, and then I started to wonder, like, why did they write those two out? I mean, I know they took the Enterprise off. I understand that. But why would you introduce new characters now? And it wasn't, you know, it was kind of the beginning of the season, but this is the final season. So I, I didn't really didn't. This is one of those questionable moves that I don't understand why they do it. And there's more of those in this episode. I mean, like that, that didn't happen in this episode, but like there's more questionable moves. I start wondering why, why they made this choice. Uh, and we'll get to those in a little bit, but uh, they make it into the area safely and see a giant castle looking structure in space. And that's the archive kind of remind me of a little bit of flash Gordon. Stargate yeah. Atlantis for me. Yeah. I can see that. Yep. Uh, so we get the title screens, and when we come back, Tilly points out that there are still high lev levels of 
Cherenkov radiation, and they point out that they can't cloak, but Burnham says, neither can the Breen. And I got my little trope in parentheses there, because they have to have some way. It's, it's always something, isn't it? Yep. And, and, I, and I sat here yes. wondering to myself, is, uh, is I, wonder, I wonder if the transporters are going to go out in this one. We'll get there, kids. Don't worry. <laughs> so Hyrule says uh, they detected a Quajon on board and have an artifact in their possession. And would like to give the, that person, uh, get that person to provide some context on it. And, I, you know, seems a fair recompense. Uh, or maybe it's a trap. I don't know. I, I started wondering, like, what, what was her motives at first? And there, there was no motive, really, other than to do what she said. So I was way off there. <laughs> uh, but this was a real reason to give Booker something to do again. Right. Which, uh, a reason to put him on screen. Yes. And this is, we'll get to it, like I said later. I hardly agree with he, that. It was a is, reach. Yeah. Huge reach. And like I said, we'll get to it later. But there's stuff that bothers me with, with how they handle him in a minute. Uh, this is just the worst use of a character I've seen in a hot minute, honestly, with him. Burnham goes to tell Booker about the archive request. And she looks like she doesn't want him to go. And he apologizes. Uh, and of course, this is one of those sappy moments I can't stand. They just can't help themselves. This one was a lot of sappy moment free, in my opinion, though, for the most part, except for that. Didn't see a whole lot of them in comparison. Yeah. So uh, there seems to be no resolution, and they go on. So the archive is amazingly cool and huge. Uh, right. I was reminded immediately of the David Tennant Doctor Who two parter episodes, Silence in the Library and Forest of the Dead. Uh, because okay. up until that point, that was the biggest archive we've ever seen that I know of uh, on TV or movies or something like that. Did you all catch that uh, Doctor Who thing there, or was that just on the, me? Well, I, I think I've seen I've seen bigger, but uh, right. I, I thought I thought they did a, a good job with what they did. But uh, I have seen bigger, I, even the um, Sean Connery movie long ago, The Name of the Rose, one Christian Slater. Oh yeah, yeah. that was pretty big. Yeah, all yeah, the Doctor Who all. one was the biggest one I've ever seen. Yeah, the Doctor Who. Yeah, well, he's got everything. Right, <laughs> he, he, yeah. he can have anything. So, uh, Burnham and Booker are led to a room by Hyrel as she tries some jokes out, and they find a copy of the Labyrinth of the Mind waiting for them on a table shaped just like the TARDIS console. Speaking of Doctor Who, did y'all notice that? A little six sided console yes. and even has a round part in the middle. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Burnham is the first to ask for the manuscript. Uh, Dr. Derricks from Beta Z left the manuscript uh, and lived out her days as an archivist. Hyrell takes Booker to another room to look at the Quajon artifact. So Burnham opens the manuscript to find a metal card inside, probably made of the same metal they had from the other thing. And she presses her finger to it and it begins to light up. And we join Booker in another room where Hyrell makes the joke of a book visiting her for a change, which is like, okay, enough. I'm tired of your jokes. That one was really rough. <laughs> Stop it now. Thankfully, she does, I think. I don't know. Thing. That further endeared me to her. It was another bad yeah. joke, a, another know. character flaw that I liked. <laughs> I would have I'm preferred glad. them all to be uh, artificial intelligence. That'd be cool. I was, very, I was very glad when that whole scene was over. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was weird, wasn't it? I didn't understand that scene at all. I mean, like, so Booker's given, uh, like, he goes over to the TARDIS table. There's another TARDIS table there and uh, picks up a box with Quajon roots in it. And uh, she tells him he's given the right because he's the last of his kind to take it with him. And he, he does. I mean, it's just the most pointless scene. Like, the whole thing was was ridiculous. And the only point I can think of that it has is just to get him away from uh, Burnham for a minute. I'm wondering if it's a remnant of when they thought they had more time. Uh, because, you know, he his race is rare. This is an important thing to their culture. It's a possibility for him to bring the culture back, blah, blah, blah. It could feed into later episodes. Uh, it's just seeing the final season, it doesn't fit. It sounds like a savvy moment to me. Like it was just yeah. an excuse to have a sappy moment, maybe, and to get him out of Booker's hair, I guess. For I mean Burnham's hair, not Booker's hair, because obviously they have to get him away from her for a minute so she can pass out. Right. 
I'll say it quick. It, it's a continuity error, and uh, I can go into detail more later on it if you want, but so you can get through the synopsis. But it's it's a continuity error. It's bad, and it should have had more explanation on it. They should have said something to the effect. And I'm just making this up. Yeah, right. I'm not. This is not real. You know, this is no spoiler. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm saying they could have been two seedlings, and that's why they put them there. They could have been seedlings for his. Right. Uh, planet's infrastructure which has like an avatar like feel which has tendrils that reach out to the whole planet and everything's right. connected he's connected to it and he's not the last person he's you actually the other one's on the on the brain ship he's uh, not the last person from the right. planet I think lies are held and, and made and and his descendant yeah. is over there on on the other you know on the other ship so yeah it, there's a lot of bad there's a whole lot of bad but this whole thing it should have been avoided unless you were going to go into explanation or you should have you know, like i said i'm making this up i don't know but my version seems more plausible than uh, you damn right what they're doing so yeah. i don't know why they do it and I, I have no idea they should have let us know a little more than just watch him sob and stand there and cry yeah. into the box it and then weak. cry some more when he's able to take it with him oh okay cool yeah thanks for letting me take it with him oh, i'm gonna cry well, a little we bit know they're gonna do that right that that's how the writing is done we we've actually talked on this a few times about how like give this deliver on on these interesting things that you bring up and then just throw away right yeah, it's there's like a they're lot focusing of on the wrong stuff. Yeah, totally, especially in this episode, too. Uh, back in the room, Barnum is in. Booker finds her unconscious. Uh, she wakes up suddenly and finds that uh, she is in the same room, but alone. She hears someone shushing her and turns to find what looks like Booker in one of the archivist robes. And we get to the end of Act One. So Burnham's mind has been taken to a mindscape, a virtual space created from what her neural activity indicates as the most important place in her life. And pseudo booger, <laughs> booger, pseudo booger, Doctor Who, right, is a uh, program that Doctor Derek's created and took its form from her subconscious, and uh, she is being tested. This is one of their many tests. Thanks to the Dewey Decimal System, Burnham goes towards the history section. Of course, she just stumbles magically onto her own answers, right? This is just, it's funny that this one ended up not being right anyway. Right. Because she always seems to just have the answer to everything. Well, um, yeah, every episode, the, the convenient Jedi knife is right here to point the way. I mean, right. it's every single episode. Yeah, so it really is. That. Yeah. By the way, I, I should note that in the real world, Dr. Culber, Booker, Rayner are, are aware of Burnham's predicament and are trying to find answers to the clue on their end. Why and Hyrule returns with all the info she can find about Dr. Derrick's, and it's just a little disc. She also announces that a green ship has arrived at the beacon requesting access to the archive. And Hyrule addresses the Breen, but the Primarch is being pushy and tells her to give him the artifact or he'll reduce the archive to ash. And Ma looks concerned, as do most of the Breen soldiers. Uh, Hyrule tells him to get stuffed, basically. And Maul tells the Primarch to calm down and uh, basically just tells him that Discovery has the other clues, which he didn't know about. Uh, and he gets kind of pissed about it. A little bit and chokes her out <laughs> and tells her that better be all the information she's withholding and again we get her we are getting a lot of camera time on this one lieutenant it's just constant back and forth and maul to him you know obviously there's something going on there uh maul even you know looks at him a bunch of times throughout this whole show it's like uh there's been some kind of off camera deal like we were talking about it's one of those b B scenes that just fell through the cracks or something. I started yeah, to wonder. We're not, we're not meant to find out until a later date. Right. So we are left out on purpose. I do feel that. If they leave it empty by the end of the season, uh, considering everything else they're foreshadowing and, and everything else we're having to deal with, uh, I'd be like, really? You know, really? You're just going to just leave it? I mean, because this is the final season. So I'm I mean, you know, say, get ready what are you going to say, do? really? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Hold my beer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. you. Okay. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, Just have that in your back pocket. <laughs> so uh, Burnham is looking in the wrong place, and she wonders why her subconscious used the archive as her most important place. 
And uh, it's because of the mission. When I'm on a mission, that's my priority. Duh. Right. <laughs> I knew that when pseudo Booker told her why she was brought here, you know, as her most important place. Hello. Um, pseudo Booker gives her a little hint by showing her labyrinths of the mind. And then she realizes she's in a maze. Duh. Again. Um, she says there are algorithms to deal with a maze. And I was like, can't you just like keep going left or keep going right to get out of a maze? And that how you do it. Well, it depends. That's the poor man's algo. There are better algos. It's like a cipher, you know. Yeah, there but I mean, worst case, one. you yeah. can just pick one way, go right or go left, and just keep making those moves. There, um, there was a, a classic D and D dungeon, wasn't there, Jay? I think you may be able to yes. help me to where the uh, classic stay left uh, screwed you, right? Wasn't no. that a module? And no, that, that was that was a DM messing with people at Gen Con. Yeah, all oh, all okay. the dungeons in the in the games and all the dungeons in the world, it was uh, it was left is right and right is always wrong. So always right. go left <laughs> in the dungeon. And I could have sworn there was a module that uh, there is, and he created it at Gen Con. Okay. It's like a homebrew type thing. Yeah, and he on purpose wanted to piss off the people at the con, and of course everybody knew the rule, and of course somebody went left and immediately died so you know <laughs> not to digress but yeah yeah you are correct there is there is that that guy who, who broke the mold back then just to piss you know i, I was just going to as a module I, I didn't think it was just like i think it is it, i can't pull it up like uh, off the top of my head but if we can find it then we can probably document it's, it if you want yeah it's not that big side note let's yeah. get back yeah, yeah. to the story yeah, all right <laughs> yeah so sue uh pseudo booker hands her a bucket of sand which this sand bucket bothers me. Uh, the funniest line in here was Burnham saying, for what it's worth, I prefer this version of you that is helpful. And pseudo Booker says, Tilly would have been just as frustrating. And I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> Much rather be stuck with Booker than her. Um, back in the real world, Rainer and Booker are getting nowhere with an alert when an alert klaxon goes off. And Hyrule comes running in saying, the meeting did not go so well, and they've raised their shields, which means they can't beam back for now, right? So here we go. There it is. They've lost their beam back option for now. This is the phoned in portion. Uh, phoned in portion of the show from when you start this scene to when they end up in the room and she wakes up. So yeah. I'm just going to warn you. So it, from there to there, this is all. So what? You know, yeah. nobody died. Yeah. Uh, Totally Every, pointless. Who cares? Yep. You know, this this is so, that kind of writing. Yeah, it really is. It really is. So Booker leaves to help Ryel prepare for defenses because he's useless again. I mean, honestly, dude. And of course, Rainer orders Discovery to hide and stand by for orders. But like, anyway, yeah, never mind, man. I just, I just don't even know what to say about him anymore because, <laughs> like, they they get rid of him again for absolutely no reason. He goes away. They don't even cut to another scene with him and her. Right. That's probably on the cutting room floor, I would guess. Right. Yep. And then he just comes back. And it's like, well, what the fuck was the point? Oh, damn, I did it. What was the point of that? <laughs> There's no point to the whole, the whole thing. <sighs> yeah, so. Except, ex you know, it's extending time. Yeah, in the show. Hey, exactly. We need a we need a 58-minute show. What, what can we do? Oh, well, we can do something we've already done. We can... You know, maybe no one will notice. It'll be fine. Everything is fine. Yeah, and I don't even know that they had to get him out of the room again for, you know, they didn't. So I don't know. So back in the maze, Burnham has got an everlasting bucket of sand, and she's not noticing the corridors she's passing through or fading to darkness. Now, she did mention earlier that she, she's like, is it getting darker in here? So she didn't sure. notice a little bit of the lights, but she didn't notice all the corridors fading behind her. Uh, which also reminded me of the Doctor Who episode, that same ep two episodes, because the Vajda Narada, you know, the mm -hmm. way they would, they were, mm -hmm. they wore the shadow. Um, Burnham thinks she has found the end of the maze and ends up right back at the beginning where Pseudo Booker is waiting. Uh, he asks her how Dr. Derricks could have been sure that she was one of the good guys. I mean, just because they want to protect it doesn't mean that anybody coming along is necessarily the right person. And I said, right here, right now, the answer is within herself. That's what I have written down. I haven't seen the rest of the show when I wrote that. That's what I wrote. And that's the end of Act 2. Back in the real world with Dr. Colbert and Rainer, Colbert notes, 
cortisol levels rising in Burnham. And uh, there's a massive jolt to the archive. And Rainer asks Reese, what's going on? The Breen are using shield tunneling technology to get their troops into through the shield. Uh, Why do we get shield tunneling technology instead of some kind of like specialized radiation with a name and shit like they, they sometimes give us? Sometimes they give us like these complex names like you like know, Chekhorov radiation yeah like referring to certain individuals in canon and yeah. then sometimes it's just like it's tunneling technology shield tunnel yeah <laughs> yeah I don't know um, I know why and I'll tell you later so let's let, Ray, let him get through synopsis yeah this is a long synopsis I couldn't it I is. couldn't shorten this one at all I tried but there was just so much fucking to, uh, just so much to say so Rainer calls Booker back, and I got in here. Why remove him in the first place? Uh, they finally got some. Uh, they finally got something for the Discovery crew to do, which I wondered whether that was going to happen or not. You know, or is this just going to be all here at the archive or what? Yeah. Um, Colbert says he needs Rainer and Booker to give him all the time they can. So back with Burnham and pseudo Booker, she finally starts to figure out it's her mind. Give me a cookie. Y'all better give me a cookie for that one. Her subconscious picked Booker because we did when we logged in. Yeah, they didn't resolve things earlier, and she wants to fix things, but doesn't know how. So Burnham admits she is a tryhard, and thinking it was the answer, it was not. She thinks she has something to prove because she's messed up for the first time. I mean, since she messed up the first time, y'all know back when she was a mutineer, she's been a tryhard trying to prove herself to everybody since then. Yeah. Um. Now we are where I wondered if we would end up. It's Stamets time. Stamets, Tall, and Reno are on the shield tunneling technology. Reno. Um, <laughs> you know, I believe the writers should have just chosen to keep Discovery out at this point. I mean, like, this is such a late addition for Discovery. Um, and just let's quick. We got to, uh, we haven't given Stamets any screen time. We haven't given Tal any screen time. We got to get all these people that. some time. Uh, Reno, you know. Yeah, that this just seems so thrown together for for the heck of it, you know. Um, so they basically come up with the board solution to the problem: Mod- modulate those frequencies, baby. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> the brain uses base duodeca de- <laughs> coding, uh, which is extremely hard to hack. And of course, one of Reno's odd jobs gives him a solution. I so I just I do have to interrupt. I'm sorry, I keep interrupting. Do. Uh, this is uh, their equivalent to reversing the polarity, right? Yeah. Reverse the polarity. Frequency modulation Reverse is their the reverse the polarity. Reverse the polarity of the yeah. neutron flow. Ah, Rainer and Booker set up the uh-huh. intercept to, to intercept the Breen. Uh, of course, a few Breen soldiers get through. And on the Breen ship, we see their soldiers getting mowed down and Maul offers to go as... Uh, She's kicked butt in close quarter situations before with the Federation, so she thinks she can handle it. And the Primarch asks if she thinks he's a fool. And I wanted to say, absolutely you are, sir. You're a really big fool. I think she was thinking I, I about I think it. that was fed to you. I, I think they, they did that. to Because everybody was thinking the same thing, right? Like, this yeah. guy has been a giant tool and fool this whole time. Yes, he has. And he says he'll send as many soldiers as he needs to. And Maul quietly speaks to the lieutenant. We've been getting, you know, close-ups of all episode and uh, says the Primark doesn't care about Locke or any of the Breen soldiers. So she's been working him. She knows. That one little tap on... See, and I don't know. Like, if they hadn't done that little touch on the arm, none of that would have made sense either. But the touch... At least they give you some cause and effect. We don't know the effect yet, but at least they give you some. Yeah, yeah, I'll give it that. Um... Back on the archive, Booker has been shot, and Rainer takes him to the room where Culber is. Rainer is put in the position to possibly have to abandon Burnham and the clue and get the hell out. So Burnham has her last chat with Pseudo Booker and admits she's afraid of failing and not being enough. Her fear drives her, and she hates it. It makes her feel small and weak, ashamed. She was even afraid uh, she failed Booker or herself. And then she, all of a sudden she finds out she passes the test. Now, if she is going to be the one to protect what the progenitor is left behind, she needs to know herself. I want a big cookie. I want a big, big cookie. I called this one, man. 
this is something I'm very good at self-assessment and being honest with myself, like me personally. So I identify with that a lot. If I'd have been put in that situation, I would have been able to spill the beans on myself like that so easily. I don't know what it is. It's some. It's very useful if you can do it. Oh man, it's so useful. I suggest every one of you like really like try and be introspective and 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 to be honest with yourself about how you really are to people, how you really are to yourself. You know, to, about everything. And when you're honest with yourself. There really ain't much that can hold you back because you know how to fix yourself. And all you got to do is take that step to fix it. So there's my little inspiration for today. Uh, Sue, Suter book, Suter Booker, Suter, Suter Booker. I'm well, all going to get mad quick. I feel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pseudo Booker tells Burnham there is a crystal in the viewing room in viewing room seven. She should get it when she wakes up and break it open. The clue is within. He gives her one last piece of knowledge, and that's how to get through to her final destination. When they get there, I guess there's a secret incantation or a way you got to hold your mouth just right to get through. Um, well, we won't know because this whole episode is about not giving us the effect. Right. So far, no effect, right? So Burnham wakes up in the real world, and after some pleasantries, they all head head out to find the clue. Uh, they do, and she breaks it immediately when the bream beam in, and Burnham screams, energize, and they beam out in just the nick of time. Who is Nick anyway, by the way? <laughs> uh, Johnny Depp, I think it was Johnny Depp. Nick of time is Johnny Depp. Yeah, excellent. Big Johnny Depp fan. Back on Discovery, they fly in to try and get the Breen away from the archive. The Primarch attacks the archive and demands the clues. Burnham is probably bluffing, but tells the Primarch uh, he must swear a Turgon a Breen Blood Oath, a sacred Breen Blood Oath, uh, to spare the, archi the archive and all its inhabitants. Uh, very shrewd, as now he'll be forced to adhere, and when he doesn't, that's when Maul and the lieutenant will step in. That's what I wrote before we even get there. That's how easy this shit is to decipher. Yep. Burnham orders Tilly to get all the clues up to the bridge so they can figure out where to go. Uh, on the Breen ship, Maul questions wh why Burnham would do this, and of course the Primarch is betting on the compassion of humans. And he usually wouldn't be wrong in that regard. Back on Discovery, Burnham gets antsy and calls for Tilly, who jumps in saying, I'm here, I'm here. And so there's obviously this sense of urgency, right? And Burnham does something that I can't stand during moments like this. It's to take this moment of a, like a deep breath and then look at Tilly and, you know, it's just like a good five to ten seconds to pass. And you're just like, bro, I'm in a hurry. Just plug that thing in there. Come on. Was I being ridiculous with that? Or did y'all, does that kind of thing bother you? It, like real time stuff. And, and when they just start, you know, it's like we have three minutes to get this done. And then all of a sudden there's all this dialogue. It's like, what the heck? Yeah, everybody's got peeves, and I think it shows up a lot in this show. I think if we let Jay speak on all of his peeves, we would never end this episode, <laughs> right? You are yeah. correct. I'm having, I have a hard time biting my tongue on this one. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, we'll let your tongue loose here in a minute. We're almost through this thing. Right. Uh, a big map comes out of the clues, and Burnham says to get a scan of it to Stamets and stand by to jump. Back on the Breen ship, they receive the map. The Primarch decides to destroy Discovery, and Maul pipes up again, saying he'll start a war with the Federation, and she keeps turning to the lieutenant. Is she concerned for Booker? I wonder. She does seem concerned, doesn't she? Not just, you know, like there's genuine concern there. I don't know. It's weird. It's it's kind of like they're trying to do this uh, 180 on her character, right? Because we yep. introduced her, and she doesn't give a shit. She, you know, she, is, she has a purpose. Um, I don't know. Maybe, I mean, may, may, I don't know. She like, they're clearly trying to intimate something. Right. But I mean, this, th this is not the character. Like, obviously she's dealing with this huge loss, which I, I don't know. I don't know if that comes through well or not, but you know, this is not who we were introduced to. This is not some permutation of that. In my mind, this is the writing. This is what happened. The writing uh, happened. Yeah. It's the bane of our existence in writers. Uh, Discovery goes into evasive maneuvers and the Breen fire. Burnham says, on my mark, now, and they begin to jump. 
Is it necessary to wait all that time? Just jump, right? Just tell them to jump. What's this on my mark now? What are we waiting on? Or just on my mark, mark, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, how it usually happens. We're not waiting on something to power up, so we need a good 10 seconds for it to, you know, charge. Just go. Yeah. Um, so they do, finally. They, they jump, and a large explosion happens right when they jump. Uh, and that's the whole point. She invented the na- nacelles. I didn't mention that part. They invented right. the nacelles to make it a little ruse, to make it look like they were destroyed. Old tricks. Um, Discovery emerges looking extra cripsy, and they get damage. Uh, they get the damage report, and the spore drive is fried, as well as the warp drive. Of course. Uh, so they're not. They're supposed to. You know. Nobody's dead. Everybody. Uh, no, not everybody. Nobody's dead. Several wounded. Just so yeah. I'm clear. Yeah. yeah. So they they got no sense of uh, they got no fast propulsion. They just have impulse. Uh, so they're not where they're supposed to be either. They have to limp to that location. Tilly says they have about six hours to the brain can reach the coordinates of maximum warp. So there's our time for the next episode. It'll be about six hours. Um, let's wrap this up. Lastly, on the brain ship, they believe discovery was destroyed. Ma is clearly upset again. Right there's you concern in her eyes. You can see it now. The Primarch wants to destroy the archive too. Not a good idea. I believe this will be the straw that breaks the Primarch's back here. And Maul calls him out about the Turgan and urges him to just set a course for the final destination. The goal is Locke. Uh, he orders her taken away, and a soldier pipe just steps up by Primarch. <laughs> and he gets shot immediately. I right. thought it was a lieutenant at first, right? Yeah. I, it was pretty funny, actually. I but, thought it was funny, too. Yeah, it was hilarious. But I thought it was that lieutenant. But it wasn't. Because uh, Maul decides to turn and confront the Primarch and addresses all the Breen in the room. And the Par- Primarch doesn't believe he needs Locke or Maul anymore. And she says, well, there it is. He doesn't give a damn about the Scion, your oaths, or the lives of your soldiers. And the Primarch makes a move like he's going to kill Maul. And that lieutenant standing next to her pulls a blaster on him and says, Primarch, don't. In that moment, Maul disarms him and shoots him. Shoot him. And uh, they get surrounded by the guards, her and the uh, lieutenant. And she just holds up a staff, says, long may uh, may he reign. And after a pause, everybody's doing it, man. Long may he reign. Long may he reign. And the whole chance going on with all the soldiers and fade to black scene. We are finally through that episode and we can let Joel loose. I don't even know. No, no, no. I, I, <laughs> if, if I go through all this, we're going to be here for hours. So I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you down memory lane a little bit. And little cherry uh, pick. Uh, I'm not going to cherry pick. You, you, no? you know, you've heard my gripes throughout the synopsis. I kept them nice and short and two worded and that sort of thing. And uh, if you pay attention to your screen right now, that's yeah, well, time. now we want you to. That's okay. time. See all right. Yeah. Who, who that? That's Johnny Depp. 90 Sorry. minutes, six bullets, no choice. 1995, Nick of Time. You asked who Nick of Time. <laughs> I love it. So now we just see who Nick of Time is. Right yeah, on. Yes, that's Nick. That's Nick of Time. All right. Uh, so in the Nick of Time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what's wrong with the show for me. And, and it really, it's, it's uh, this episode does it the best so far this season. And it, this episode's got some low ratings yeah. uh, compared to the others. It didn't do well. It's uh, if you check up here, uh, let's see, Star Trek Discovery. It's already at like six point four out of ten. I, they usually get in around a seven or eight when people really like them. You know, yeah. when they get too low, when they start going below seven, you're like, you know, bring it on, come on, stop. So <laughs> I, I'm I'm gonna tell you what I think. Um, this, there's there's major things that piss off the veteran viewer, just like anybody that crushes canon and, and 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 does all this stuff. But one of the things that people don't put two and two together, the way they don't bridge the the stuff is, uh, I I made a comment, a little comment there on each scene, and I go, hey, you wasted this character. Hey, you you, you didn't have to give us three minutes of of this chase down the hallway in the in the library and and do this little fight for nothing and take this character away and then bring this character back and then take this yeah. character away and bring this character you don't need to waste our time we're not idiots right we're, we are intelligent viewers who have paid attention to star trek for quite some time and we, we know what we like and we know what we don't like 
And uh, one one of my biggest concerns is is be- the best example of it is in this show. At the very end of this episode, you see Michael Burnham, and you see uh, the, who is that? The first officer, which are both off the ship on the library, and they double click their little com badge on their chest, and they're already walking and they're already in motion on the bridge of the enterprise in yeah. a little second of a scene. What, why is this a problem? Well, you meant discovery, not enterprise, right? Yeah, yes. no, I meant, I meant, I meant both. Cause I'm, it's cause I'm telling you, cause it, back in the enterprise day, I got you, got you. We, we have, uh, um, we we have a transporter chief. A transporter chief is a big deal. Uh, it was a big deal in Abrams' work, and where he caught the guy mm-hmm. falling. And yeah, it was, it was a, a trope. You know, right. he caught the, the the transporter chief caught the guy falling as he's moving, coming down, and you know, slammed. I think it. I, I think it was Captain Kirk. He was slammed into the 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 pad. You know, and he was yeah. like, well, "How did you do that? It's impossible." It was Checkoff. You know, you know, doing. Yeah. Um, that's gone. All that trope is gone. It's all missing. There's that three minutes of garbage you got is because they've killed the transporter section, the transporter chief. Yeah. The, that whole section is gone. It's gone. I don't, uh, we talked about this last week. Nah, I called them L comps, but they're all L cars. Right. Why do we even have L cars? They have L cars on their left arm. You see them swipe up yeah. and they have L cars. And I'm like, why, why are you, why do you care? You've got an AI for a, you know, a ship. You don't need anybody. We've gone from, uh, Nate, Nagel, is her name? Nagel Barrett, which Major Barrett, Major, Major, Major Barrett. Yeah. Forgive me, Major. Um, yeah, we, you know, you've gone from her computer voice, which is a basic AI comparatively mm-hmm. to this AI. Right. What, what are you doing? I mean, there shouldn't even be a, a barely a button on any console there for they shouldn't even need them. They well, they've got those little them. hologram co- uh, uh, communicators, right? So right. technically they could all just stand there on the bridge with having no consoles at all, nothing there. And they, they could just could. have all their stuff right there in front of them. They While could. we're here, I did want to drop one thing. I, I think <laughs> they did do right by going with a traditional voice actor for that as opposed to an actor. For what? For which one? For the voice of the computer. Zora. Okay. Yeah. 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 Agreed. <clears throat> well, well they, isn't it the girl that played Arium or something like that? I don't know. She looked like her. It might uh, not be her. I looked her up. I, I don't think she's done much They've on had two, screen work. Two girls play her. Let's hope so, it hangs on because I just AI thought she looked a lot like her. AI in our real life is replacing a lot, which yeah. they they could have had a whole episode on that. They yeah. love reflecting our politics. Why not right. reflect real life? Go yeah. ahead and tell us how real AI is doing in the real world. Nevertheless, the the some of the basic tropes of Star Trek that caused us to be interested for a few minutes, watching the guy slide the the knobs up positioned. I mean, yes, yeah, you know, Sean's doing it. So yeah, there was that took us a minute to talk to what was was the guy that went from TNG to DS. Call Meany. O'Brien. Call me. Call me. Call me. Chief yeah. O'Brien. Chief O'Brien. You're you're both correct. Yep. Chief O'Brien. A brilliant character. A brilliant Absolutely. character. We I learned love so it. much more about him when we got they to DS9. Put a, a lot of character. work into him, like even they on did. TNG, but definitely on eventually DS9. on DS9, he had whole episodes yeah, it was just great. dedicated to him uh, and Julian. Uh, you know, yeah. the doctor. Yep. And we've had doctor episodes centric before, but we've never had not really. I mean, not the transporter chief. Not you know, as DS9. I was like, what are you thinking there? Because he wasn't the Scotty character which reno kind of reminds me of the Scott right version. exactly and which i that's why i think that's why we enjoy it but yeah where's where's uh where's chief o'brien you know that's a fan favorite well well we they should have made chief reno o'brien chief o'brien completely. i think yeah but we they didn't they made her scotty you, you know no, it. i know i know well stamets is supposed to be that's the thing stamets they never is, he's not even the chief engineer that's what <laughs> bugged right. the hell out of me right, right. so yeah. we never even saw the chief engineer whoever the that's hell right. he was and right. uh then Reno comes in. I'm like, okay, you make her the chief engineer, right? But now I'm saying, screw all that. Make Stamus the chief engineer and make Reno your character that doesn't exist, the, the transporter chief. Right. And, but of all, course, all we of, have Rainer filling in for Bones, right? That's yeah. that's what he's doing. He is. Yeah. In any case, the bulk of this episode has got those moments that we have lost in our legacy 
uh, history of Star Trek. And it's just replaced them with supposition, foreshadowing, bad storytelling, and we're getting it picked. I mean, I, I would see something every 30 seconds going, why didn't we do this? Oh, yeah, that's right. We don't have a transporter chief. Why didn't we do oh. – man there's no there's no there's no freaking doctor you know that has a high maintenance i mean what was the doctor doing there why was the doctor conveniently in the library you know and yeah. then why did he leave the room why didn't he stay with burnham you know he was like there's nothing i can do we can't do anything if we transport her out we're, we're screwed she may die getting transported out we can't we can't leave i can't do anything as a doctor except tell you what the freaking tricorder oh i'm sorry did anybody have a tricorder because i'm just kind of guessing did you not see the scene i mean it's like it's like there's a you know just out the window we, yeah. we, don't, we can't bring a a portable med bay that would have been cool if there was such a thing as a portable med bay yeah they kind of iron manned out of a briefcase i mean how cool would that be it would have been you got cool. a portable med bay yeah. and then you could have some more information give him some trope give give the scene something going on give with it the doctor. something yeah it's all missing it's it's all gone and then you you have to insert i mean in the mortal words the of moment Sebulba, that sean loves, you know that poodoo you insert. got you got to insert the poodoo okay yeah. poodoo. all right but that, that's it i mean I watch the show same as you. I, I agree with you know what you're saying and, and all that stuff. I I don't because if I go into it, I could go into all those scenes in great detail and we would be here a very long time. So I'd just rather give you the whole synopsis and, and the best example I can think of is them at the end pressing on their chest and avoiding you know any contact with past legacy and honoring where they came from. You know, it's just nah. Let's just take a piss on the writing here and phone it in. So yeah, this this episode pissed off a lot of people. I don't yeah. think a lot of people noticed why, but yeah, it's 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 apparent. I mean, a lot of legacy is missing from this episode. It's just a lot of supposition and they're so garbage. dead set on filling fifty seven minutes, man. That right. you know, but I think back to when Mandalorian first came out, and yeah, there was there was times I was mad when I only had like a twenty eight minute episode, right? But at least it wasn't was filled with garbage. Minutes. Yeah, it wasn't filled with garbage. It was a heck of a 28 minutes. So I, I just wish they would do that. I mean, they could have left a lot on the floor not, or just not even shot a lot and um, come in with a half hour episode and boom, we're done. Yeah, did you notice how our first 30 seconds uh, in this episode were um, the establishing shot was uh, – Unreal six or six? Is it Unreal six? I don't know. It's Unreal and and is it five? Okay, so it's Unreal and then you go it, it pans up and you do see the sticks just like you were talking about. You see the sticks and them pounded on the ground, but that's all Unreal. And then they they jump up and the you have, may have to see it. There's an arc and then they dive in to a round area where everything takes place. I wonder what that round area is up there. <laughs> I wonder what that is. So yeah, it's all Unreal 6 to a round area. I'm not going to say it, but you're welcome to if you want. <laughs> it's I'm almost some it. kind of space or volume, perhaps? Uh, yeah, it might be. Something. I think it might be or, some kind or, of volume. Or uh, or orifice. I don't know if that make that was <laughs> that would be hilarious. <laughs> Imagine them calling it the orifice. <laughs> Man, we're shooting the Mandalorian. What's this round thing? Uh, well, we, we, we like to call in. it the orifice. <laughs> we like to call it the orifice. That? I like that better than the volume. I do too. That's fantastic. <laughs> Let's call it the orifice. Uh, we'll have to write them. Hey, man, orifice. That's what we go with. Okay. Then <laughs> they're having their meetings in the orifice. <laughs> Yeah, but that was the eye candy in the beginning, and I thought it was fine. And it, I don't know if you noticed the, the previous episode before this one, it was J.J. Abrams style. And I don't know, I don't know if it was a nod to him or the tip of the hat, but uh, the previous episode was. Uh, you could easily play that down, 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 because they started out with the flashlights and the camera in Unreal. That right. God, that and they me were crazy. lifting up. They were lifting up the front nose of the ship in the first in the beginning of it, and I was like, yeah. "Come on!" So yeah. maybe they were, maybe it was an homage, you know, type of thing, and maybe that, I don't know. This is not an homage to Mandalorian, but you know, <laughs> my yeah, God, dude, it, just, it was a cool his, shot. He loves his lens flares way too much. <laughs> oh yeah, no, give, give, give me that flashlight in the in the seventy millimeter, you know. I'm I, yeah, let, let's do this. 
yeah. but yeah that that that's you know that's it really i don't i don't really have you, yeah and i don't tech stuff you see there's not much of it yeah and i don't i don't know that we have to go into really great detail because i mean dude we we just yeah we just tend to be repeating ourselves because it's just a pile on of the riders here's my question are we ready for a star trek without a, a goal without a script you can have a script but without like the story right like I've, obviously we've had these chains of stories that they're trying to follow right um and what i'm talking about is i remember a lot of times i i enjoyed from like uh tng and uh tng and ds9 more times where the, there was nothing critical going on, right? We we're just living a day in the life of somebody on the ship or on the station. Some of my favorite episodes, A Day in the Doctor is one, one of the name of them. Exactly. Um, and so I'm kind of wondering if it would work to take some Star Trek, put us somewhere, have a loose idea of what's going on in general, and just give us procedural. That's rare these days in almost mm -hmm. every single TV show that you find because almost everything has done away with the encapsulation of an episode. Everything is a continuation yep. now. Almost yeah. everything we watch is a continuation. Yeah, even um, Strange New Worlds is yeah. very serial. You know, it's as close as we're getting, and it's still going to have the arc running through it. Yep. Yeah, yeah I'm we're just saying, like, I, I think that's fertile that ground to, to push back on that. I think people would respond to that and watch it. Oh, they'd love it. Yeah. But it would be if you wanted to retain, you know, legacy audience, then why not give them some of the things they might like, you know, give well, them that section. But yeah, here's here's their chance. They got a show coming out. Hopefully, if it ever comes out called Legacy, why not shoot it legacy style? I have a bad feeling about this. <laughs> I really do. I really do man. Yeah. Well, listen, they don't have to shoot it legacy style, but they could use a lot of the old stuff. Or certainly, let's just say it's solid serial, you know, um, serialized. Yeah. You still want you still want a little bit of some connecting threads and stuff, which, you know, if you do it like TNG did it, not bad. Well, here's my idea. Like, I, honestly, like never mind. Six, I don't want to give that idea away because somebody will take it and run <laughs> yeah, with it. And it's it's a really good idea of how to do it. Yeah, don't do that. Um, but yeah, uh, there there is a way to do it. And, and you, know, you come up with the story on the fly and it works and people will love it if you do it the way I'm thinking of. And um, yeah, there, there's space for it. But yeah, nobody's going to do it because you have to get started up. And, you know, there's the whole thing with like who gets involved and hands on it. Well, that's the story for the AI to write. I think if you want to do a procedural, let the AI write it. Just give it your parameters. Let it write a story. That's well, probably the one time I'd let AI be used in a situation like that. Right. Well, in this day and age, I'm wondering, like, obviously everybody's trying to use AI for everything, obviously writing. I'm kind of wondering if, like, it's going to evolve to this place where I'm kind of expecting where there are writers who are using AI to avoid writing rooms and um you know uh coaches and direct you know other directors and stuff um and just offload all of that onto the ai i think that's where we'll see like good products coming forth there'll be people people that will yeah. try to put it all on ai and then there will be people that'll be like oh, i'll put this this and this in ai and i'll pull it out see what it looks like and take a look at it fix it right I can't think of what the name of the script software is that everybody uses in Hollywood, but uh, it would surprise me if like they if they got some kind of AI built Jay. into there. I, I think it's changed in recent years. You'll see. It's on the tip uh, of my brain. Let me think. I it's can't iPad. think of it either. It's you iPad. Scribe? It. Yeah, huh? it's it's iPad. It Hold on, I'd have to look it up. But I I saw a picture of a. Uh, Man, I hate name dropping her name because I don't. I know I'm not going to like her work, but Leslie Headland, uh, Kathleen Kennedy's, you know, new Golden Girl that's mm -hmm. that's doing Acolyte. There's a picture. There's a pre, uh, pre, behind the scenes picture of her holding it with the script notes on an iPad with one of those Velcro backing things on her hand and she's yeah, going over yeah, script yeah. notes. I've yeah. seen the picture, but. I, and I see the name of the script, you know, uh, software. Yeah, it's in my on my, but I, I can't think of it. I just but yeah, I think, think it's it on either. iPad. 
I'll put it on the screen while in post. No worries. So anyway, that's enough of that stuff. I think we've covered it all. We're coming up on an hour now, so let's just stick a fork in that episode and be done with it, guys. It stars? I'm sorry. We're going to give it stars. We want to give it stars. Yeah, we need to be consistent in that regard. I almost forgot the stars. So, uh, two. Yeah, two. Absolutely. Two, two. sounds good to me. Yeah. yeah no, <laughs> right no way am I giving two it more. Across the board. Yeah. No, they no cut doubt. off Reno, and they're not going to get that extra bonus from me. They, they, I don't know if you saw that. They, they gave her the like less than they gave her the episode before, and I was like, Bleh. yeah, yeah, just go away. Oh, the whole the whole thing with them pulling putting putting him in there was just senseless. It was just like yeah. uh, here here have a little something to do real quick so y'all can get some screen time. Yeah, I, I didn't time. I didn't appreciate that at all. Yeah. So guys, uh, that wraps up this episode, and you will see us in uh, a few days for the podcast where we are very much threatening to talk about the Fallout show in its entirety. So. Stay tuned for that, guys. Be looking out for it. And uh, Fallout TV, Fallout games, and everything, everything, everywhere involving Fallout, right? That's the next episode. Right. Right. <laughs> that's right. So uh, right. remember, as always, be excellent to each other. And Brian, Joel, and I will see you on the flip side. Thank that's you so right. much, everybody. Peace out, everybody.